So welcome everybody. Um, we uh, are going to talk tonight about the En-ROADS Climate Simulator. Uh, Glenn Alexander is going to be hosting and uh, Glenn has uh, attended a, a formal training on this model, the simulator model, and uh, he will be sharing the information of some basic information about the model. And then he's put together some examples of, of uh, cases so you can get an idea of what the model shows and how it, uh, it looks at multiple things at the same time, multiple, and, uh, and we'll let him go with that. So Glenn, here's to you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. And um, thanks to everybody who's here and coming. Um, I did want to just briefly thank uh, two of the people who are here in particular. Um, Jim has done quite a bit of work with me the last week or 10 days on getting ready for the presentation. Uh, Paul and Tim have both um, uh, been supportive of the model and trying to get it in front of um, the congressional staff of uh, Morelli. And then uh, Dave Ruckberg, who's not with us tonight, but uh, he actually took the paper and, and uh, did a lot of early editing for me. So that was, that was very helpful. So let's just uh, go ahead and get started. Okay, I'm going to move my, Katie, can you, you still, I mean, if I move my pictures around, I wish I could just get rid of, well, okay, that's okay. Mine are over on the side now. Do you see the mine or you don't see that? You just see the full screen, right, Katie? We just see the full screen. We have we have the Zoom numbers, you know, Zoom, Zoom people on the right-hand side like you do, but it's not from your screen. It's just from our part of the Zoom. Okay. All right. So uh, what we'd like to do in the next hour or so is, um, as Jim said, um, I would like to give you some brief overview of kind of what the model is and how it functions and what type of results you see from it, what kind of analyses you can do with it. Um, but really the reason I wanted to, eventually I ended up writing everything down on, on a, a paper that called Searching for a Sustainable Future. And that's what I'd really like to spend the bulk of the time on tonight because um, this isn't meant to make all of you experts on the model by any means because um, I'm not an expert. Um, but uh, I'd, I did develop some insights and uh, came to some of my own conclusions, and I think it has, um, there's some important messages in, in here for all of us. So uh, that's what I'd like to, uh, to share with you during the bulk of the presentation. Uh, but I'd also like to make sure that we've got um, 15 minutes or so at the end of the meeting, particularly with a small group, to uh, just get your own feedback on uh, did you – what were your insights? What was what did you get out of the presentation? And maybe uh, you know things like who else should see it and that sort of thing. So I'm getting used to. Okay, I guess I have to click on that. Okay. <clears throat> so let's do talk a little bit about the En-ROADS model. Uh, fundamentally, what it does is it projects changes to the climate out over time based on human behavior changes, uh, things that we can, can um, activate, if you will, either through our individual behaviors or through policy or um, different variables that you're going to see incorporated into the model. I think it's important to uh, just point out from the get-go that uh, this is a global model, uh, which sounds pretty audacious, but uh, uh, it has been validated against a number of other climate models. There's quite a number out there, some of which are are um, U.S. based. So you'll, and I've I've done some analyses with some of those others that you can say, well, if we do this in the United States, how many, what happens to the uh, CO2 emissions that we as a country emit. But uh, this is a global uh, model, and it runs it all the way out to the end of the uh, 21st century. Um, there's three different institutions that were instrumental in putting this together. 
I won't um, really dwell on e any of them in particular, although Climate Interactive are more or less, I think, the keepers of the model and making continuous updates, but they also get support from Ventana Systems, who is primarily a software company. Um, and then the uh, MIT Sloan School, uh, one of their professors has been quite instrumental in um, put it, providing input to it as well. Now you're gonna see in a minute um, what the interface looks like. And uh, it's easy to become overwhelmed with um, all the levers and the variables that you can play with. But uh, if you kind of keep in mind as a headset that everything we're gonna talk about uh, modifying or ch making policy changes and what have you have to do either with the energy supply itself, uh, which is to say, looking at the um, all the mix, the mix of uh, both fossil fuels and non-fossil fuels as energy sources and, and um, how we can influence the, uh, the relative mix of those over time. Um, what En-ROADS calls the energy demand is really taking a look on the demand side as individuals and as, and as industry and business of um, what we can do in that category to, um, to make things more efficient, to uh, adopt more uh, uh, electric vehicles and that sort of thing. And I'll show you that in a minute. And then um, I'll tell you, let me just get into it and I'll talk a little bit more about agricultural practices as well. So I think if I go down here and I click on the, um, the inroads bin business as usual, <clears throat> Let's start at the, the bottom half of the screen and work our way across. Uh, these are all of the 18 variables that you can either operate them by slider or you can go in in these three vertical dots under each of these parameters. Coal, for example, you can open that up and, and do a more of a detailed definition of how you want to, uh, to modify the, um, the policies relative to coal or any of the other um, eight or ten variables on, under energy supply. Um, in the middle is our uh, infrastructure for the demand side, how we use our uh, transportation energy, how we utilize buildings, uh, our energy to um, heat and cool and uh, provide energy to, <clears throat> excuse me, to power our, our uh, infrastructure. And also we'll talk a little bit about uh, I guess it's obvious, but um, if you were to so decide to, <laughs> I want to look at what happens if the population rises or falls, that's under um, the growth category. And then uh, same with um, GDP growth. Over on the right-hand side, it's really not so much dealing with um, carbon emissions, rather it's dealing up here in the upper right-hand corner with um, methane and other non-CO2 gases, and um, that's a very important variable, at least I've come to that conclusion, and I'd like to point that out as well. Um, this in, down here is uh, essentially carbon <clears throat> uh, sequestration, uh, removing carbon from the, the um, atmosphere, either with technology or with uh, farming practices. Now, Let's go up to the top because this is where you see the, the resulting effects of any of these. Now, keep in mind that at the moment, uh, everything, all the black uh, circles there are centered on the status quo point. So basically, it's saying to us that hey, if we don't do anything extraordinary over the next uh, 100 years, um, then by the time we get out here to 2100, our temperature will not be at two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. It will have risen all the way to 4.1 degrees. So that's clearly an unacceptable outcome. And the whole goal is to see, okay, how can we mitigate that? How can we bring that back in line? And what do individual changes do? Um, more importantly, what do combinations of changes do to, um, to get that to a point where we think we've got a, a viable, uh, sustainable, <coughs> excuse me, sustainable future. 
So let me go over here to the left-hand side. What you're looking at here are <clears throat> uh, the amount of energy that is um, provided by each of these sources. Uh, and I'm going to change to another, another graph. Um, I, it's it's more clear to me if I look at it on this basis. Um, actually, let me. Uh, never mind. <laughs> um, So what, what we're looking at here are uh, where does our energy come from given uh, the pricing that goes in, the relative prices of each of these uh, sources of energy, be it coal, be it oil, which is really petroleum products to uh, drive our transportation system primarily, uh, be it natural gas, which is increasingly used to, um, to create uh, electrical energy uh, versus coal. Uh, this wedge on the top is renewables, uh, and that gets a little bit bigger as, as time goes on. And then uh, bioenergy itself actually is a, is a source. Um, nuclear is a little sliver. Um, and any of these variables we can change, and I'm going to go back. Um, let me show you now. For each of those sources, What's their relative contribution to, um, to the CO2 emissions that they produce? And it doesn't take long to realize that the, uh, the primary culprit is coal. And it's, um, in 2020, it's, um, it's not much more than, than uh, petroleum products. But by the time we get out to uh, 2100, you can see that uh, it's really because even if the U.S. has moved primarily away from from uh, coal, a lot of the rest of the world is not. So that's a big source of um, emissions. Um, automotive, if it's hard to see in this graph, but you'll actually notice. If, I'll go back and look at it. Uh, This is one where it's it's good to see it. So you notice um, this is just looking at each one individually versus stacking stacking them all up together and accumulating accumulating the results. But here we see that by 2060, uh, the the petroleum industry has started to taper off anyhow, and that's due to the natural progression of um, of um, electric vehicles. Uh, <clears throat> but it's um, it's still quite, it's the second biggest emitter even in that latter part of the century. And uh, down here, we're, we can see a continuous rise in, in uh, the use of natural gas. And over on the right-hand side, we see the temperature being affected by, by all of that. What I want to do, I'd like to do before we... Um, get into the analysis part is just in terms of familiarizing you with what you can do. I'll go back to this coal. One could decide, for example, that um, and this has been talked about um, in a number of different places, but um, what we just did was say, okay, we're going to stop um, building any new coal infrastructure on a global basis. And we're going to start uh, the last year we're going to allow any new coal infrastructure to be built is 2025. Um, it's outside the scope of this model to say, well, how do we enforce that? And is every going, everybody, every country going to uh, sign up for that? But we're assuming, and I've heard, um, you know, maybe it isn't, maybe 2025 is too early, but The big thing that happened here, obviously, is that coal went almost to zero um, in that in that time frame because all the um, the older 
power plants have have um, coal coal fired power plants have but come to their end of life and we're not developing anymore. And even if we stretch that out another ten years, uh, you still see that it's a it's a major impact. Um, but if, conversely, fossil fuels have I mean excuse me natural gas as a fuel source has uh, has taken its place basically because um, it's a better alternative economically at this point than um, it's not a we don't have enough renewables in the system to to really drive down everything okay um, one last thing I want to do while I'm here is in addition to we always talk about CO2 emissions, but um, it's just as important, I've come to realize, is we need to uh, get our minds around non-CO2 emissions as well. Um, and what we're going to do, we're going to go back to the base case now. So now we're in the base case of business as usual. Um, what we have here is not only the the emissions of CO2 directly, uh, which is this big black one, and we've had all the sources combined together. But now we take a look at the the other non-CO2 gases that um, climate climate scientists are have conversion calculations to say, okay, this amount of methane that's in the atmosphere has an equivalent of so many tons of CO2. So they transcribed everything to CO2, um, and it's important to recognize that uh, what that, how big that contribution is. And if we, uh, again, just um, well, I'll come back and show show you how we're going to affect that later. But it's uh, it's equally important as I've gone through here to sort of throw out the ones that don't make a lot of difference. I mean, they sound good, but um, what if we said we wanted to plant a million or billion trees? Well, okay, let's try that. Um, what if we said the percent available for forestation grows to 100%? Well, it barely moves the needle, frankly. Uh, it's a good, it's not harmful. <laughs> it's a little bit helpful, but it isn't going to get the job done. Uh, even um, another one like nuclear. Um, let's say we had a nuclear R&D breakthrough cost reduction out over the years. We've gone to, um, you know, we're, we're at four degrees. We can move it all the way to the end, but if we go to far enough, we can begin to have some impact. But um, Nuclear is, even if you think nuclear is a is a good energy source and can be made safer, uh, the time for these new plants to come online is just not fast enough to have the impact, uh, particularly in the early years that we're looking for. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Let me go back to... I think I did better than this the other day, Jim. Uh, okay, here we go. So if we just step back and say, you know, where do we stand if we don't do anything? A lot of things are um, getting are bad and getting worse. CO2 emissions have doubled um, in that time frame. And the temperature obviously rises versus the two degrees uh, or less. And oh, by the way, we're at uh, 1.27 degrees today. We've talked about this. This is um, one of the things I wanted to point out, though, is that we we are all very to, attuned to uh, HR 7763 and putting a a fee on carbon emissions. 
Um, so it's obvious that that will impact all three of these fossil fuel sources simultaneously, which is good. Um, and that's why it's we're going to see in a minute here that um, it's probably the biggest thing that we can biggest hammer we can reach for. And just to spend a minute on this chart that we showed just a moment ago, if you look at it in a numbers basis, one way to think of, well, how significant is, is methane? Well, um, petroleum products in 2019 were responsible for 13.3 gigatons of, of carbon dioxide directly. Methane as a uh, greenhouse gas produces almost as much equivalent impact as as oil so <laughs> we've got to got to get our minds around that um and if it's it doesn't get any better really uh, without doing something extraordinary so uh, by 2100 it's still neck and almost neck and neck with uh, with petroleum products Okay, I'm going to, so the rhetorical question is, and let me uh, just quickly go, I, somehow when I get myself out of the full screen mode, I don't think I can go back to full screen. I can make it bigger. Are you guys okay with it the way it is? <laughs> Nobody can speak but me. Yeah, that, that's okay. Go yeah. ahead. Let's see it okay. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll just keep going this way because it's a little bit – I can I can get there, but I'd rather just keep going. <clears throat> so, oops. It's fairly obvious what we have to do. Uh, we've got to provide – we've got have to have renewable sources that are going to have more of an impact in the short term than they are now. And that's only going to happen if from a pricing comparison standpoint, they are more favorable versus fossil fuels and in a, in a much more dramatic sense. Another aspect, which is that middle section of, of our energy consumption is, um, we actually need to see if we can find ways of reducing the amount of energy that as individuals and as uh, businesses and government, our infrastructure demands. Uh, in other words, we need to make both our transportation and our building systems more efficient, uh, as well as perhaps thinking about moderating our own, own consumption. We'll talk about that in a little bit. <clears throat> Um, certainly need to reduce non-CO2 emissions, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, carbon sequestration. On the other hand, let's, uh, let's not spend our time on things that don't have a, the greatest amount of, Im uh, of impact. So what I did in the analysis was I spent... a you know, some amount of time looking at essentially all of those variables to one degree or another and began to separate out the ones that um, are essentially the prime movers um, in terms of looking, okay, if you just did one thing, what would be the most impactful? If you did another thing, what would be the second most impactful? And then I rank ordered those, um, and you, you come away with several conclusions that, when you're looking at this bar chart over here. Um, on the one hand, the carbon price is twice as good as, as any other solution looked at um, one variable at a time. It's twice as um, effective as increasing our, our building uh, efficiency. Um, coal is... Uh, is significant, but it's also redundant with uh, carbon pricing. So what we're going to see is that 
we're going to get most of the effect of carbon of uh, reduction in coal uh, by just doing carbon pricing on all fossil fuels. And then uh, the other, what we have here are, are eight variables that are um, had the most significant impact, and essentially we've we're ignoring the the ten others, but we're doing the ten others, or we're ignoring those after um, having looked at as many of them as we uh, well as we spent some time with with each one of them. But the other thing that jumps out at you is, uh, okay, we want to get uh, we want to go from four point one degrees down to two. That's a 2.1 degree drop, and the biggest single impact we have is one. So what does that tell you? It basically says that um, we've got to put things together in combination, and that was the gist of, of what I started trying to, to experiment with, and that's what I'd like to, as we go through here, I think you'll appreciate the, uh, the significance of this. So let's just take a look. Um, I got my speaker notes over here. I'm just going to do a quick time check. I should be at the 25 minute mark here, and I'm 26 minutes and 47 seconds, so I guess we're doing okay. Um, we're going to look at the, uh, the, the what I call the big three uh, carbon pricing, building efficiency and um, methane reduction. And I'm going to take each one of those, and by virtue of going through these first three, you'll see the, the technique that I employed. Uh, first thing you have to do is decide, okay, well, what do we mean by putting a price on carbon? Or what do we mean by, uh, what is it, how much of a methane reduction are we, are we striving for in a policy adoption? So that's the action side of things. And then uh, for each one of those sets of actions, uh, we're going to see some resulting uh, changes. So what I did with, uh, it's, it's just, it's a rough approximation um, of the, of HR 763 as it's currently defined, uh, starting with $15 a ton, um, I'm pessimistic enough to think that we're not going to get anything done even in 2021, but let's assume it would be um, up and running <clears throat> with, uh, with something close to HR 763 by 2022. So uh, we started $15 a ton. We increased it by $10 a ton through 2040, um, and um, which is a, that gets us to $195 now. I'm not even sure what HR 763 says in terms of its long term, <clears throat> if it's if it has a cutoff. But I cut it off there. Um, so what we we see here in terms of if you can kind of recall back to the uh, the base case where coal, oil, and natural gas uh, were all big and getting bigger. Um, obviously, coal is, has uh, come down dramatically. Um, it's a little bit hard to see it on this particular display, but um, natural gas has come down as well. Uh, we haven't done much to him. We have done a little bit to impact uh, petroleum emissions, but uh, obviously there's, there's more to be done. And perhaps most importantly, uh, that's how the temperature changes uh, if we if we were to invoke this policy. So you see here by we start to slip off of the base case uh, somewhere in the mid of uh, uh, twenty third in the twenty thirty decades halfway through, and then as we go out, we continue to move away from the base case over time to the point where we have reached three, a 3.1 3 degree change if we didn't do anything else. Um, Jim, I can, if anybody does have a question or want to, you know, want to get clarification, I can, I'm happy to take those questions now because uh, I think it's an important 
each one of these first three that we're going to talk about deserves some attention. Yeah, I, um, there, there are a few things that are coming out in the chat, but there's nothing that specifically questions about the way the model works. Okay. Um, Paul made the comment that we should probably replace HR 763 with EICDA, yeah. um, Energy Innovation and Carbon, Div Carbon Dividend Act. Yeah, it's just my... That's okay. Verbally, <laughs> it's... I'm going to, I am going to show you this, this case in real time and, um, take the time to go down here and, and look at this carbon the way I invoked it. $15 a ton starting in 2022, um, take us out to 190, 195, uh, over the next 18 years. Now, uh, you'll, you'll see that it could become more aggressive, um, if we basically, I'll just do this roughly speaking, but if we spread this out, uh, so we could we could be more more aggressive. But what I was trying to do is develop. I don't want to put the whole burden of the solution on one of these variables. I think we're we're going to have to have a a, a mix and match scenario. So that's essentially what I've done uh, in that particular case. So um, I'm going to move on to the second major action, which is, um, and it, it might be worth try, trying to explain exactly what we're doing. Um, Jim and I had a conversation about this in the very beginning, is this is not just the the non-resident, this is a combination of, of um, residential home efficiency improvements as well as uh, the commercial and industrial uh, infrastructure of buildings, our heating and air conditioning, uh, our appliances that we utilize and so forth. Um, now the model doesn't say, well, okay, let's, uh, uh, you know, let's, let's define a rate at which people move uh, from um, oil-based heat to, uh, to solar or something like that. Um, rather it's, it's stated as a, uh, a change variable that says we know um, based on existing data that um, if we don't do anything else, the natural rate of progression uh, in this particular sector is the efficiency is going to improve about 1.2% a year. Um, and the model provides a, a, a um, slider to say, well, okay, what happens if we were to increase that? And it begs the question of, well, how hard is it to, to do that? Um, but um, as it turns out, even though I said five here, uh, you get the same effect by the time you get to a 4% increase. So that that's good, I guess, because Jim was challenging as to whether that was really 5% sounded pretty, pretty aggressive since he came out of that industry. But um, obviously, it's, it's going to require incentives. Uh, low-cost loans, um, it, as well as just um, um, our own self-interest. We uh, be as homeowners, be as uh, uh, automobile consumers, or or be as people CEOs who are in charge of a a corporation around the world. And I think the good news is, you see, you're reading more and more articles where, <clears throat> you know, some of the leading companies are not waiting for government to uh, tell them what to do. They're seeing it in their own best interest <clears throat> to make these changes. So I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, this is not an, <clears throat> excuse me, unrealistic um, action to take or policy to propose that we drive forward. <clears throat> so what is the result? What's our observations? Well, that does um, half a degree, um, good but no cigar. Uh, it is important to realize that um, the amount of energy consumed by the the world uh, has go has uh, taken 20 percent off in 2060 and, and a total of 40 percent off by 2100. So that's a, a significant amount of uh, energy that is no longer needed because we have a more efficient infrastructure, which says that uh, we can spend our money on other things. Um, and the other thing that's important to realize is that 
this is really an added, pretty much an additive process. In other words, even if we have a, a carbon fee, which is, is having the impact of um, making the relative price of fossil fuels versus non-fossil fuels um, change, uh, this is actually saying, well, you know, regardless of what the mix is that's out there, we're going to require less. So it's, it, the combination of those gets you more than, gets you almost as much if you add, the, if you take the two together. So uh, I'll show you that in just a minute. Okay. Um, and this, this chart here is just taking a look at that 40% number. So I think, I think it's a very energy smart policy, if you will. And, and, uh, it's not in opposition to a carbon fee. It's really complementary to a carbon fee. Um, and it's what's going to, it's, I think one of the key things that we have to, you know, um, through public education, through government engagement, what have you, uh, we we need to have more light shine on on how we move our uh, building infrastructure to a you know a carbonless uh, more towards a carbonless solution. Okay, now so let's look at let's look at this one um, carbon or rather methane. Um, here again, in terms of the action that we take, um, I think I'll go, I'll take you into, inside of this one for, for just a minute because it's worthwhile seeing what are we, what is it we're doing? <clears throat> the way that you can, can make adjustments and improvements, you'll see here that, um, we can change the amount of, um, methane and other gases that we take out of the atmosphere on a percentage basis over here on this slider. Um, basically, it, what it's, the implication is, from an agricultural point of view, among other things, one of the key drivers is it's saying that, um, you know, the population is consuming less, less beef, uh, frankly. It doesn't say you're, you're doing away with it entirely, but you're... Um, uh, through then that or perhaps some other techniques, uh, we're going to say let's let's strive to get 25 percent improvement in our agricultural emissions. Um, and at the same, by the same token, you also um, get methane and other gases generated from uh, industry emissions. And they're you know they're looking at different technologies for. Um, eliminating that and going into the atmosphere in the first place. And uh, so I said, let's, you know, that's a technology solution. It's not so much a um, population um, uh, cultural habit of, of um, our beef consumption. So let's say we can do that 50%. Um, and we, we're going to start that in 2025. Well, okay. Um, we've, um, we've done a, a, um, Four tenths of a degree, just on that basis. Uh, the one before that was the half a degree. So you know we're starting to. If we can add these up, and they aren't entirely additive, but they certainly support each other. Okay, so let's go back. Um, so just a couple of other comments and or. Um, observations is that uh, we basically knocked two-thirds of the uh, total emissions, non-CO2 emissions down. And remember that we said that, you know, if we don't do anything, then this was rivaling petroleum products as an emitter of, of CO2 or CO2 equivalent, at least. Um, I think it's interesting to to think about how we can sort of nudge uh, the consumer away from more towards, I guess, plant-based products or certainly away from beef. There's other forms of meat that uh, don't have the same issues. Uh, and I frankly didn't pay a whole lot of attention to this because um, we all talk about CO2 and how many tons of 
CO2 are emitted, but uh, it's pretty impactful. Uh, I think um, pound for pound, um, methane has a more more of a negative impact on temperature than uh, than does CO2 directly. So that's why it's so important. Okay, and there we've we've started to tip this this puppy over a, a little bit by here. Let me just catch up with my notes. So So these this just summarizes what I what I've been saying. Uh, if we take each one of those individually, this is what the temp how much the temperature is lowered, and here's here's what the net impacts are if we do these actions over in the the left side. Uh, and just to reiterate, even though there's eight variables, I toss coal reduction out because it's taken care of by carbon a carbon price. Um, so essentially what I'm going to do as a next step is to say, okay, well, even before we go any further, what would happen if we were to incorporate all of those variables simultaneously? So what if we could, uh, through our collective action of um, our worldwide population and our worldwide uh, government bodies, what would be the result if we were actually to say, Let's do all of these, and, and bear in mind that if we thought they were strictly additive, we could take uh, 1.9 degrees uh, off versus 2.1. Are we going to get there with that? Well, not quite, um, but we are going to get take a significant bite out of it. We basically come down to 1.6 degrees. Uh, if we do these things simultaneously, um, we're, we're down at 2.5, and we're only a half away. If you think success, if you can wait for, you know, uh, if your goal is to not exceed uh, two degrees increase by the end of the century, then uh, <clears throat> this is going to take us a long way towards getting there. Um, and what's happening is that it's the combination of uh, uh, the fee is going to encourage more rapid substitution of, of renewables. Uh, building efficiencies are going to reduce the demand, and then uh, methane itself will um, take a lot of, of that out of the atmosphere. So if you look on the left-hand side at this particular chart, I mean, we've – We've taken, this is the net greenhouse emissions. This is everything combined. We've taken a huge chunk out of uh, going from 100 down to 40. We've taken 60%, uh, almost 60% out, um, out of the atmosphere in terms of emissions. And our, <coughs> excuse me, our final, as we've said before, we, We've taken, we're not, we're using a lot less energy. To be specific, we're using 50% less than we were before. So that's a, in my mind, that's a pretty uh, high priority set of things to get your mind around. Um, do they have to be done? Could you pick others as a composite set? Um, let's put it this way. If you had to pick three, I don't think you could pick three that would have a, a combined impact more than this. But since our goal is to get to two degrees, not 2.5 degrees, then um, I'm not going to take you through each one of these remaining four variables, but I'll summarize in this chart <clears throat> and just say, okay, what does it mean if we slowed economic growth? Well, you know, that sounds like uh, heresy, but is it really? I mean, uh, what if we went to a four-day work week, for example? Um, what if we, through culture, culturization or culture change, uh, we convinced ourselves as a, as a population that, um, hey, maybe we, maybe we don't have to be on this same treadmill. 
Now you have to do this equitably for this to, you know, be fair to everybody. But uh, if I take uh, a half a half a percent off of the GDP uh, from 2.5 percent down to 2 percent, that alone has a three tenths of a degree impact. Um, same thing. Uh, another important one uh, that's really pretty immature in terms of its, uh, you know, it, it's it's out there in terms of having either the technology or the agricultural practices uh, put in place to uh, to do massive uh, carbon sequestration. But again, the to the extent that we can move the world in that direction, either with a combination of uh, technology and uh, better farming sequestration practices, uh, that has a two tenths of a degree. It's basically it's sucking uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it putting it back in the ground. Uh, when I first thought of or heard of that, I thought something doesn't sound right, and I think a lot of technologies may never come to pass, but the more you read about it, uh, the more you see that people are looking at different technologies, and of course our crystal ball is pretty limited, so who knows what will happen in 10 or 15 years. Uh, a related aspect from a congressional point of view is that um, if you want to read a little bit about it, there's a, a bill that's in Congress right now that is, I think it's it's um, bipartisan. It has a, um, several co-sponsors at this point, bipartisan. They call it the Growing Climate Solutions Act of 2020. And uh, in a nutshell, what it's um, proposing to do is to shine a spotlight on uh, and get the uh, agricultural community to, to move in the direction of uh, verifiable sequestration practices, meaning they'll, they'll be monitored, they'll be measured, that sort of thing. So that's hopeful. Renewables, um, renewables, the more we, more expensive we make fossil fuels uh, without doing anything in terms of uh, upping the ante on the supply or the supply side of renewables themselves, the more they will take hold. But if we accelerate uh, that even more so with uh, <clears throat> a dramatic cost reduction um, through it, and it's going to be cost reduction in terms of both the, the energy source itself, meaning the, um, the wind and solar equipment, but also the storage of, uh, of the energy uh, has to be improved. And that has a, Another two, basically these last three each contribute two tenths if you take them by themselves. Okay, and that last but certainly not least is, um, and this is not, it's not saying in essence that we are moving everybody to a <clears throat> uh, an electric vehicle in one fell swoop or over the next 20 years. It's because it's it's not just looking at the automotive and trucking transportation network. It's saying, okay, now keep in mind there's ground transportation that we talked about, rail, but also obviously air, not to mention sea. Um, what if we can move that uh, efficiency of that entire infrastructure from a half a percent a year, which is where it's at now, up to two and a half to five? So. Is that challenging? Sure. But um, I just read something uh, today about uh, one of the solutions for um, air, uh, for aircraft, is um, increasing use of biofuels. Whether they're efficient enough to, to make that happen at this point, I don't know. But that's something that people are looking at. Uh, same thing with... Uh, Shipping, both uh, commercial and tourism forms of shipment or um, ship travel, uh, may over the next 10, 15, 20 years um, have some breakthroughs that will allow 
as Jim and I talked about the other day, I mean, we have nuclear submarines now. Can we not have nuclear commercial shipping? Uh, and maybe that's the best place for nuclear. So, um, in the interest of time, we're getting we're at the 50 minute mark. Um, I'm just going to co so go to the, the net net and and say, okay, what happens if we do do that? Well, we have, <laughs> we got there. Uh, it wasn't planned in advance, but uh, uh, by a judicious choice of uh, all of those variables in terms of how we establish the policy and put them all together. And, and the beauty of the model is that it, it interacts with it. it. It doesn't add up things separately. It, it shows the interaction of um, uh, breakthroughs of, in terms of cost in renewables on the one hand and um, the relative price of, of uh, renewables versus fossil fuels uh, through a, a fee on the other hand. So it's, I'm impressed with the sophistication of the model and the degree at which it takes into account things to prove to come up with a viable and credible um, solution <clears throat> or answer, in effect. Um, so the if I mean we're not this this analysis doesn't say hey we are um, we're carbon free, particularly if we take the other greenhouse gases into emission into consideration, but uh, we've certainly dropped the emissions by 2100 uh, down to their lowest point of the century. In fact, if you go back to where we are right now, we're at 60 gigatons thereabouts, okay? Uh, it never gets bigger than that, and it starts to drop dramatically, and that has the effect of, um, we're put, since we're putting less into the atmosphere each year, then the accumulated amount that stays in the atmosphere over time uh, begins to drop. I think I've got another chart on that. That's this chart over here on the right. It's essentially saying, well, okay, how many parts per million, uh, which um, scientists, climate scientists say that we've got to be between 400 and 450 parts per million and no more in order to um, have a sustainable temperature and all that. And oh, by the way, that actually does happen. Um, in the in the uh, decade of the of the next decade after this, um, and amazingly, the amount of energy <laughs> required actually goes down by by over seventy percent. So, what does that? What's what's my uh, takeaway from this? And I'll, we can certainly unmute the mic mics at any point. Uh, Jim, but um, sort of in the, uh, at a qualitative level, what I have really come to the conclusion from, um, I think we should all feel. Everybody's not true. <laughs> What's that? What'd you say? I've got just about everybody unmuted. Sarah, there you go. Um, okay. So anybody can uh, throw out any questions if you want. Um, yeah, so these these are my sort of um, fifty thousand foot conclusions without getting specific, but um, and I do think we can get there. <clears throat> I, I don't. I think the biggest unknown is we don't know what we don't know about future technologies. I mean, who would have predicted iPhones in you know in nineteen eighty three when we started to have PCs? Um, so. We can't discount a lot of uh, new technology, but it it's going to take a lot of investment, a lot of work to, to get there. Um, I personally don't think that one it's a one-size-fits-all solution, as we've seen here. I can't imagine the complexity of, of orchestrating this <laughs> on a worldwide basis. Uh, we certainly have to change some of our own habits here at home in terms of our are uh, politicians, uh, and it, one of the reasons it's difficult is it's it's global. I mean, 
uh, we can make all the changes we want, but uh, we need to have everybody in the in the same boat with us. And it's a combination of government leadership, not here, not only here, but all around the world. And certainly individuals and business uh, can uh, do a lot of things before government takes takes action. So that's that's my two cents worth. Um, I'll open it up for questions or comments or reactions or where do you think we should go with this and who shouldn't hear it. Well, I think you've done a great job. This is a, a really uh, excellent uh, summary of things, and uh, and I think it's going to be you know a good a good presentation. We'll be happy to uh, share this in a lot of places. Good. Um, it gives the idea that you know if you think about one person trying to do everything, it's impossible. But a lot of different people are attacking all of those aspects across the world, you know, globe now, yeah. um, and more is going to continue if we can get some sort of you know, global leadership to make this, you know, to, to put a focus on this, um, it, it definitely can be done, just like we can get, we got to the moon in 10 years. So, you know, this is, this is that kind of a, all right, let's, let's put everything together and let's all work together, and that's going to be a focus along with everything else. And, and we know that's going to have positive impacts on the economy. It's going to have positive impacts on people's health. It's going to have positive impacts on a lot of things that we haven't really even taken into account. We, kept th we keep thinking, well, this is going to make everything harder for everybody, but it's not. It's going to make it easier for people, but they need to get past the point where they have to think about all that has to be done. No, I, t I totally agree, Jim. Um, Paul, what's your feeling about how we should – or what type of reception would something like this have with the, uh, the Morelli? So be before, they, before we go there, just a couple of – comments on things you said in the last five minutes here. Whenever you talk about reducing GDP, <laughs> that's a lightning rod for criticism from certainly the conservative side and yeah. also from the business side, because what they'll say is, see, we told you, you know, they're going to wreck the economy. And now Jim, you're saying, but actually things are going to get better in a lot of ways. And I think at some point you have to sort of quantify what you mean by better, right? To try to combat that, that kind right. of reaction. Good, good point, and it's yeah. the same kind of thing with, you know, as you rightly say, you know, we don't know what technology is going to be invented. That's kind of an easy, lazy way out for a lot of conservatives right now because they say, well, innovation is going to save us, right? We don't know what's going to be invented. Yes, but uh, we need to make the point that you know, you're talking about a lot of things here that are already in hand. And since we don't know what's going to be invented, we don't know when it's going to be invented either. It's a much better insurance policy to start working with the things that we've got. Yeah. Rather than sit on our hands and, and wait for, for breakthroughs, right? No, you don't. You definitely can't do that. Wow. Right. I mean, you certainly show the urgency of that with, uh, with the business as usual graph. Right. Right. Yeah. I read an interesting article yesterday. I think it was in Vox. Um, I'm not sure. But the gist of the article was that the local benefits in terms of health improvements uh, will be great enough that it will actually pay for the entire shift from, from fossil fuels to electric. So um, there, are, there are factors that this model doesn't even take into account that work in our favor. That's right. No, I think that is, um, that's a very, I mean, by their, I mean, if you would read the documentation on the model, they, they actually say exactly that, is that they, they're not looking at, uh, you know, sort of paying for um, the cost of the transition through, through health benefits or even uh, uh, less dramatic weather events and that sort of thing. Um, it's certainly hard to quantify. But another, in fact, Al Hibner is the one who put the article up in the um, CCL Town Square. I don't know if, who's, who's seen that, but uh, it was a Vox article. And it's a summary of um, a guy who's a sort of a self-educated climate scientist, I guess. I mean, he's a PhD, but he's 
started to focus a lot of his attention just on the whole subject of climate. And he's looking at it from an ing- more or less, a, you might say, an engineering point of view is, okay, well, well, what do we have to do from the bottom up and how much will it cost uh, if we, um, and he, he doesn't even get into things like carbon fees. He basically says, hey, we're going to, um, he, he, he equates it or likens it to um, uh, the mobilization of our economy in World War II, you know, uh, it's you have to go through a massive, uh, rapid. Uh, on the on the first three to five years, it's it's a matter of uh, putting together the capacity for providing the uh, decarbonized equipment and the decarbonized um, infrastructure, uh, and then in the next, when the capacity comes online, then you take the next ten years to sort of begin to suck that into the economy. Um, I actually read, I downloaded the article itself. I mean, the box did the summary, but then this guy ha- has a um, an organization called, um, what's it called? Uh, Rewiring America? Or is that Rewiring a- America, thank you. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, and I downloaded okay. You go to their website, rewiringamerica.org, and you can download the paper. It's a very, it's a very detailed paper, um, and I frankly think it's, <laughs> it's probably, and, for, and he's only focusing on the U.S. Um, I'm pessimistic that we could do that in the way that he's described by by twenty. He basically is says, okay, if we do this, and I make everything carbon free by 2035 then uh, you know we'll have climate solved by 2050 um, on the one hand I'm not sure that's realistic but on the other hand if you look at everything he's you you could say that pretty much everything he is uh, alluding to is things that are implied in the model the way we put the model together um, in the sense that uh, you make more renewables more attractive, you uh, build out the infrastructure uh, on a carbon-free um, basis in in our transportation industry, in our building industry, in our construction industry, and so forth. Uh, and he also puts in big numbers there for <clears throat> R&D expenditures that will help to make some of these breakthroughs happen. So... It's it's an interesting uh, way to look at it, and uh, I, you, but it's a fifty thousand foot view. He's basically saying you've got to do everything <laughs> for this to happen, mm-hmm. and um, and there's not a lot of time. But um, that was it was a good paper. Glenn, thank you very much for uh, for putting this together, and I'm going to close off the recording at this point.